Welcome to another great conversation on Think Radio Presents Think Planet. Think Planet is made possible by support from the Western Colorado University School of Environment and Sustainability, empowering future change agents to foster ecologically resilient, economically sustainable, and socially just communities throughout the world. Become a Think Radio Presents partner at patreon.com and you'll also get access to premium content you won't find anywhere else. Join us today. In this episode, I offer part two of my conversation with author and creative writing educator Sean Prentice. Prentice and I talk about his belief that all writing is nature writing, why the genre is so important today, and what it takes to do it well. Sean, let's get back at it. Last week, we enjoyed a great conversation about your book, Finding Abby, talking about Ed Abby and his way of thinking, his way of seeing the world. Um, Your journey in the process of writing that book, I want to shift again and and talk to you more in depth about the the issue of nature writing yep. in general. Not really an issue. The the uh, discipline of nature writing. Ed Abbey said he hated that that label. I'd love to know why you think he didn't appreciate that phrase, nature writing. I think Abby always wanted to be the great American writer, and he strove all his career to write the great American novel. And I think Desert Solitaire, people would say that's his foundational book. And my guess is that frustrated him because I think, and I might be wrong about this, that he wanted it to be a novel. Hmm. And he wanted it to be you know, one that lasted the test of the time. So I think being called a nature writer was saying, you're cute, you're interesting, and what you look at is trees or saguaro <laughs> cactuses. Right, tree hugger. And that's not what the great American novel is about. And so I think he was saying, I am a writer. I am an artist. Uh-huh. And I might have trees or cactuses in my stories, essays, novels, but I'm beyond that. And I think on some levels he's completely right that, you know, it, we're, we're, nature writing is not about looking at a tree. It's about looking at humanity as it relates to that tree or cactus or uh, all those more global things. Well, not always. I mean, some nature writers will just simply write to you about what they see. Uh, so Abby seemed to have a different a different view of that, that if you left out the human side of the story, then you were missing something. But I'd even argue if you just write about that tree, you're not writing about that tree because it's coming through the human experience mm-hmm. and it's teaching the human. So all stories are about how to survive as humans. So when we're looking at this beautiful image, what is that teaching us about our own lives? Okay. So I would say that no writer can just be a nature writer and no writer cannot be a nature writer. So I would say that we are all not <laughs> not great nature writers and we are all nature writers, which did not help this conversation at all. It, well, you just muddied the water for sure. My apologies. Uh, well, I, I find it ironic that of of all of the books that Edward Abbey wrote, his novels are fun to read and yeah. they're very informative and they're, uh, and, and they're more than just genre fiction mm-hmm. by far. I'm thinking of Monkey Wrench Gang and Hey Duke Lives and, and, and some of the others. But of, of all of that body of work, Desert Solitaire is what he'll be most remembered for. Yeah, that and then Monkey Wrench Gang I would argue his most beautiful book was one of his last books. I think it's his second to last book, Fool's Progress. Mm, and, mm-hmm. and, you know, it's a story of a dying man going back to West Virginia in the book, really to home Pennsylvania. And, you know, by the end of that book, I've read it twice. And both times I was sobbing at the end. <laughs> and I think, you know, again, <laughs> Abby's problematic. We talked about that in the last episode. But then this book has some of those same elements. But if, but if you can get into the human part of it, it's just a stunningly beautiful novel. And it's, I think, where mm-hmm. he finally wrote his great American novel. It's not very well read. Well, uh, that probably needs to change. Desert Solitaire turned 50 this last year. It was published in 1968. Very widely read. But perhaps, I mean, could you say it's the most widely read book in that sort of nature writing 
genre that you're aware of? You know, Monkey Ranch Gang might be outread or might have out be out. I don't know how to say that. <laughs> yeah, more people might more have widely read. read. Yeah, more widely read. Thank you. But those two, yes, I mean, a couple of million copies probably mm-hmm. between those two, mm-hmm. which is stunning for this little subgenre of nature writing. Something that so many people would find, quote unquote, boring or nasal gazing. So why was this book not boring? What was it about Abby's perspective on the desert? Um, in various essays, various settings, sort of revolving around his time at Arches um, as sort of a seasonal gatekeeper there. Um, where do you see the humanity in, in all of that writing that has stood the test of time? Number one, it's got to be good writing. And this is something that Abby doesn't get a lot of credit for. Not only is he a really detailed writer, but he has two other things going for him. One is he was brilliant, and he was a philosopher. He's, he received his master's in anarchist philosophy. He was really just in philosophy, but he studied anarchism. But he d- knew the classics well better than I do. Uh-huh. And if you read Desert Solitaire and his other books, there's all these very subtle references that might uh, I might not get and you might not get, but if you know it well, they just pop up. So number one, he's so smart. And number two, when I was, I read him here in Gunnison, 1994, and I was a 20-year-old kid, a 21-year-old kid. Mm-hmm. And it was one of the few books that spoke to me. Abby would have, he was already dead by then. So he would have been 63, 64, 65, but also his life was over. And yet he seemed alive on the page. And he seemed like someone I could sit by a campfire with and have a, a beer and a conversation. Mm-hmm. And he saw the desert through the similar lens that I did. So that was another part of it. And then the uh, third thing that he does so well, and I think sometimes this pushes people away, but he's funny. (laughs) Well, he's, yes. And and not just funny, but brilliantly so in that he, he manages to put you right there in his boots in that moment. Yep. Um, Which is something that, that, few writers really can can achieve in the same way. And I think one of the things with doing all those things, too often environmental writing or nature writing is heavy and emotionally draining. And Abby was that person who could rile you up and get you excited and get you willing to plant the, uh, you know, the monkey wrench flag in the ground and take a stand. Where some writers, you're just like, oh, man, yeah, we're in big trouble and yeah, there's no more. way out. I wish I didn't know that, but now I do. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, and so now I want to use that discussion right there as sort of a launch pad yep. into talking about nature writing in general. Because we're surrounded by it these days. Every third article in the mainstream media these days is something to do with our predicament in the environmental world. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, of course, that's journalism, and we're talking about something a little different. Mm -hmm. It's maybe a literary journalism, Mm -hmm. as it's it's practiced by a lot of nature writers. And I would like to point out that you've just become the the program director of the nature writing track with at the... uh, graduate program in creative writing at Western Colorado University. So this is your profession. Yes. You understand this question. What are the key elements, first, of good nature writing, but I'm actually more interested in responsible nature writing, writing that pretends to inform us in a way that motivates action? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to get into the trenches just a little bit. I break it down into two branches. Nature writing being writing that looks at the natural world. And this is, you know, looking at that the beauty of the tree or trying to figure out when the tree drops its leaves, when the buds come back on, why it drops its leaves. So it could be the science of it. It could be the beauty of it. And then I call environmental writing looking at how humans interact with the natural and built environments. And that term I 
stole from terrain.org, which is a wonderful literary journal in the environmental movement. But what environmental writing does is it says, how do, how do humans interact with the environment? What are we doing to the environment and what is it doing to us? So it's more complex. And I kind of see, if you were to look at the history of nature and environmental writing, I use the Industrial Revolution as a big divide. Not that environmental writing didn't occur before then, and not that nature writing doesn't occur now. But in the beginning, we were trying to learn, especially in America, you take the boat across the sea, you land here, and you say, who are these people? What are these animals? What are these plants? What are these trees? How do I survive? So we're doing natural histories. Mm -hmm. And we're not looking at, you know, what does this natural environment do to my soul? We're looking at, how do I live on this new land? <laughs> and we're trying to learn it. And by live, you mean survive. Survive. Yeah. Yeah. Tomorrow and the next day. And then as we start surviving, as we start taming the land, otherwise known as destroying it and killing off the people, mm. then we start missing some of its wildness. And then we start going on walks like Thoreau did. And then we start wanting to protect it because now uh, industrial society has popped up and we go from one factory. And at one point there was one single factory. I think it was maybe 1784. <laughs> and then within 20 years, there's thousands. Sure. So now we're starting to get into wilderness writing. And now we're starting to get into environmental writing where we're saying we need to protect this land for this land's sake. And that's even a little problematic because, you know, we want to keep all the people off, including the people that have always lived there. But it's all right because we got rid of those people. So, you know, <laughs> we've forgotten about them. Right. We've forgotten how the land is complex. Yeah. And then we get smarter and smarter. So that's what I see as the divide. And then how do we responsibly do it is a wonderful question. I would say one is you have to know the land. So it's hard to write as an outsider. And I... My lake where I live in northern Vermont, it has pickerel and perch and pumpkin seed, and those are all native species. And then it has brown trout, and these are not native, and they were brought in and they're dumped in every summer, but they're not considered invasive because they don't upset the ecosystem. They fit into it, and they're called naturalized. And then we have invasive species. We have uh, milfoil, which will come in, and at some point it'll destroy our lake. And when we write about the world, we can either be native, we can be naturalized, or we can be invasive. And I think, you know, for me, I'll never be native to Vermont or to Gunnison, but I can be naturalized. And what that means is I need to learn the people, the culture, the place, and how we fit into here. That requires an investment of time mm -hmm. that, that not that many people have the luxury to commit in, in a mobile society like ours, where we're chasing jobs, we're chasing the next career advancement. Is it possible to be naturalized? I, I'm going to pick an arbitrary number. In a year after moving to a place, is it possible to really know a place in five years, or does it take a lifetime? I mean, it would take many lifetimes. But also, I think about when you visit another culture and they speak another language, and are you willing to try to speak their language? And if you are, you're working towards naturalization. And if you're not, if you're bringing your culture in, then you're invasive. So part of it is, is a product. It's, it's saying, I now know this land as well as that tree knows it, if we can ever get that far. But part of it is a process of just working toward understanding this community on a human and environmental level and seeing how we can get in sorts of symbiotic relationships where we improve the quality. So, no, we could probably never do it fully, but we can work on that process. Mm -hmm. And so, in order to be a responsible nature writer, and the reason that I use that word is because there are some high-stakes questions that we have to ask ourselves and answer. Mm -hmm. And it's our nature writers, largely, who are leading us to what those really important big-picture questions are. Mm -hmm. So leading society in the wrong direction yeah. is an irresponsible thing to do. Um, if I'm a reporter or a staff writer somewhere and I'm sent out to um, study the effect of climate change on coral mm -hmm. in the South Pacific, what hope do I have of writing as a naturalized, in a naturalized perspective? 
I go back to Abby and his ideas on anarchism being about, say, a watershed. So it's a small localized community. And so much of it is not that I can change all of us in every way, but if I can start getting people to care about their home ground or my home ground, and I would, I would say even more importantly, so I want to teach you about my home, but then I don't want you to protect my home. That's my job. Your job is to learn about the love for home and then see how you can bring it back to your place. And I remember Rick Bass wrote a beautiful book about the Yak Valley. And in the, in the end, he said, protect mine. And I love that idea of asking the reader to protect our individual homes. Mm-hmm. But I think more importantly, it's learn what we love about one person's and then see how when we move six, eight, 10, 12 times a career, how we can ground ourselves in that place and become naturalized slowly to that place. Mm-hmm. So if we're writing about the coral reefs, those are not my coral reefs. And I might not even be influencing them with my good or bad decisions. But if I can learn about them and say, huh, what should I do to protect my lake? And if we all do just some little thing, that'll help make big change. So that's the first thing. Then we also have to not feel like it's hopeless and not feel like we're bad. And those are (laughs) <laughs> well, that's a message we receive all the time. Yes. Is that the reason we're in this predicament is because we're all bad. Yeah. And maybe we are all bad, but it's who we are. And we're also all good. Hmm. And we're also all filled with joy. And I cannot be the perfect environmentalist. I flew from my home to Mexico, from Mexico to here, and then from here to Vermont for work. Uh-huh. And if I was a good environmentalist, I would have stayed home. And I can either punish myself for that or I can, you know, show that environmentalism is complex uh-huh. and being human is complex. And it's also a lot of fun. Which we talked about it at length about Ed Abbey. Yes. He, he sort of uh, embodied that idea that complexity is just baked into the cake. Yep. That it's not, it's not all uh, white or dark or hot or cold. Yep. But... <laughs> This is an idea that I can't really escape, and I come across it in lots of different venues, uh, lots of different conversations with people, is that it's possible that one of the biggest obstacles we have right now to meaningful change is that we think too globally. Would you agree with that? And, And in that sense, what I'm saying is, If I'm constantly distracted by what's happening in Antarctica, Mm -hmm. then it's more difficult for me to see what's happening right beneath my feet where I actually could do something tangible. Do you agree with that idea? Completely. Yeah. And so I wrote Finding Abby. It was about searching for home. And then I am working on another book. It's about bow hunting and it's learning how to bow hunt in Vermont, and it's with a couple of mentors who are my wife's aunt and uncle, Uncle Baron and Alicia. Mm -hmm. And they're teaching us how to live in Vermont, and they're saying, this is a different culture. We're going to help you naturalize. Mm -hmm. And bow hunting is going to teach me that, make my food much closer uh, to the source, so close that I bring about its own death. But then my next book after that looks at, it's a collection of poems about my lake. And it's it's a natural interaction, say a, uh, a a heron fishing or the sun going across the lake. And then it looks at the science of that. And then it puts it all into a poem. And then my next book I want to do, and I don't know if I'll ever write this one. So I want, I just want to walk across my community, just my little town, just my little watershed and visit a variety of people and places and learn about it. And what I realize is, oh my gosh, all I write about is home. And I get more and more localized as I get more and more naturalized if I do it right. <laughs> and then all I have to do to lead a good life is learn my land and try to fit into it. And by land, I mean the people as well. Uh-huh. And then share those ideas in fun conversations with my neighbors who I agree with and I disagree with and I love. And that to me is so much more important than trying to protect something far away. And so here's back to the question of nature writing. If you're going to sit down and write those experiences, 
What does it take to write about your particular place in such a way that somebody in Oregon could pick it up and profit from it? To me, all writing, and I said this before, it's about the human experience. So it's not about nature because we're too egotistical, maybe. We can't get out of our own ways. We've got to trigger, try to figure out how we're going to survive on this planet uh -huh. with love, with friendship, with community, with place, with jobs, all that stuff. Uh -huh. So whatever I'm writing about is the human experience. So what I have to do is tell good stories. I have to use vivid details. I have to have some personality that interests you. Uh -huh. I have to have some river above who, what, where, when, so you can see what's going on. But then that river below, that bigger idea that resonates, you drop a rock in a lake or a river and it ripples. And a good story does that too. And if I tell you a story that takes place in Vermont, you don't say that's a dumb story because it takes place in Vermont. You say either that's a dumb story or that's a good story. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we have to do is, and what those great writers do is they tell stories about the human condition that take place in a beautiful place. And this is going to jump back to an earlier idea, but I would argue that all writing is political, all writing is nature writing. And what that means is if you're writing about the suburbs and you're not thinking about nature, you're taking a stance there. You might not even realize you're doing it, but you're doing it. And we're on camera right now, and you and I are dressed in a certain way. We didn't talk about what we're going to wear, but we look relatively similar. Our haircuts are relatively similar. Our outfits are, are telling some story. Mm -hmm. So... What that means is that no matter how we write, we've got an agenda, even if we don't realize it. And it's all about how we think the human condition should be hmm. dealt with. So self-knowledge then among writers. I, now I'm, now I'm, I'm going to find a hard time um, saying the words nature writer. You've convinced me that, that um, that's maybe a, an artificial distinction. Everything's artificial. Yeah. But if I'm going to um, be a nature writer, it's important for me to understand myself, to know what those agendas are. And I think I remember reading Loving Abbey and then looking for the next Abbey. And there's so many Abbey knockoffs. And the problem was they wanted to be someone else. And those most authentic <laughs> voices, Charles Bowden is not trying to be Abbey. He loves the desert in very, very similar ways. And they went out into the desert in very similar ways. But then they turned in different ways. Or you look at Terry Tempest Williams, loves the desert. Probably, okay, she's a, a native of the desert in ways that Abby was not. Mm -hmm. And she saw the desert in a completely different way. And know thyself, yes. And then thyself is... Be that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, be yourself, but also be your place. Mm. Be your place. What do you mean by that? Well, so... I wrote a textbook, and one of the big ideas in it, it's called environmental nature writing, and it's about nature writing. And one of the big ideas is that no human is themselves without their place. So what that means is if we were to lift ourselves up and put ourselves in San Miguel, Mexico, where I just came from, we'd be influenced by that, and we could not help that. And then if we moved to Vermont, we'd be influenced by that, and we could not help that. And that doesn't mean we need to love that place, but it, needs, it means we have to recognize that place influences every human all the time. And it's not just a bed sheet behind us. Oh, look, there's a, a bed sheet of mountains behind us. <laughs> it's that those mountains are literally influencing everything about my interaction. Sure. The weather, the water. Um, but they, my emotional core, too. Right. Yeah, my philosophical thoughts, hmm. um, what I'm worried about. So you put me in a city and I was taking the taxi home at night. Why? Because the people I was staying with, they were saying, you know, hey, be careful at night. It's a little dangerous. Mm -hmm. Where if I'm here in Pitkin and I'm walking the trail from my friend John's cabin to my cabin, I'm worried about a little danger because there's mountain lions up there. <laughs> it's a different so, picture, though. Yeah. And that influences who we are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's kind of the argument that animal rights activists make when they go to a zoo and they say that's not a lion because you've removed it from its environment. And so, but with human beings, we have the ability to adapt on purpose, right? And so if I, if I do need to go live in the city, how do I adapt to that place and make it my own, even if it's not my first choice? I'd love to know the answer. 
I wouldn't have had to write a book, <laughs> quit a job, buy a new house. I don't know that we can adapt to new places all the time. So I think we can survive, but there's something different between adapting and surviving. I could have lived in the city for the rest of my life, but I would have given up many important things. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I was willing to give them up because that was the core of my being. And I don't want someone else to give up their core to move to the places I love. I don't, and that goes back to the global versus the local. Mm -hmm. You have to find your soul, your mind, your heart. I don't know what the right word is. Your spirit needs. Mm -hmm. And you need to push yourself, I guess. But I mean, if you found your place, why leave? And if you haven't found your place, why stay? <laughs> well, interesting point. Some people would say, though, I don't have the luxury of mobility. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the conversation we're having today is based out of privilege. And we're blessed about that. And that's another thing that nature and environmental writing can do is it can shed a light on those people who have less opportunity and the land that is less valued. Mm -hmm. And that's just as important to say. So I live in a, the North, I live right on the edge of the Northeast Kingdom in Vermont and it's economically depressed. And those people have less of a voice mm -hmm. than I do. And if I don't reckon with that, and if I don't reckon with the land having less of a voice because of that same reason, then I'm stepping on those people. Hmm. And, uh, you know, we've got to try to be complex. So for people who have set out, it's their ambition to be a nature writer. Your advice, I'm going to paraphrase for you, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, is to look under their own feet, wherever they are. Look, look here, um, because there's a story to be told wherever you are. Is that right? Well, not the thing I love is wherever you are, because it could be your home, but it could also be when you travel. What can we learn from those other cultures? What can they teach us mm. about what we want to do and what we want to stay away from? And for me, mostly what I want to write about is my home. But we can learn so much from those others, and we can learn from those others who have less voice than we do, and we can give them voice. Sure. Yeah. Last question. Who are your favorite writers right now working this, this topic of describing place and the people of place and what it all means? There's so many, but <laughs> I'll go back to my, my innermost community, Joe Wilkins, he and I wrote environmental nature writing together. And the reason I chose to work with him is because he's brilliant and he's a hard worker and he's of place and he knows place and he's filled with kindness. And his writing is so beautifully empathetic. Another writer that no one would consider a nature writer is Steve Coughlin. He's a poet. And he wrote a beautiful book called Another City. And it's about growing up in Boston in a poor family. And his older brother was murdered. And it's what that did to the family. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to me, that's as much nature writing as, as it is poetry, as it is memoir, because it's about place and how that place affects those group of humans and how living in that place, you know, totally transformed their lives. They had a murder occur because of that place. And mm -hmm. again, dropping a rock in a lake and, and the book is so beautifully heartbreaking. So that's another one. Uh, you know, Terry Tempest Williams, her book Refuge rocked my world because all of a sudden, you know, environmental justice ideas bubbled up without me even understanding what that meant. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I spoke with Doug Peacock and reading his work. And what I love is his persona versus his intellect. We often see him as as a bear, you know, and, mm -hmm. and then what you don't always recognize is the intellect behind that. But I could go on and on and talk about the beautiful people doing beautiful work from their home grounds. Sure. And uh, we could be here for yeah. another two or three episodes. I realize that was an unfair question because, you know, the list could go on and on. But that's that's a, a really interesting peek into your thoughts about what we call nature writing. And that is that place is place no matter where you are. And I, I thank you for this conversation. Thanks for coming by. Alan, thank you so much. Think Radio Presents is a production of Alan Morris Media. The show's producer is Isa Forrest. Associate producer, Aaron Lewis. Thanks for listening. 
Become a Think Radio Presents partner at patreon.com and you'll also get access to premium content you won't find anywhere else. To leave a comment on today's show or to suggest a great story for a future episode, visit thinkradiopresents.com. Tune in next week for another great conversation on Think Radio Presents Think Planet. Thank you.